Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday, August 26th, 2015 episode of Free Webinar Wednesday. This is Eric Cook, and I'm with WSI Internet Consulting, where we work with businesses and organizations on helping them better understand and leverage the power of the Internet as a strategic business tool. You can learn more about me and WSI online at www.poweredbywsi.com. Hard to believe we're here in the last uh, week of August, but uh, we are, and uh, it's good to be back in the saddle because we took a couple weeks off, and it's even better to have my good friend and free webinar Wednesday partner, Mr. Jeff Simpkins, officially joining me again. Jeff, say hello to everybody out there in free webinar Wednesday world. Greetings, everybody. This is Jeff Simpkins, and I am with Community Bank Consulting, Inc. And you can learn more about me and Community Bank Consulting, Inc. online at www.communitybankconsulting.com. Excellent. So as, as I mentioned, we've been somewhat absent over the past couple of weeks with travel. Um, anything new or interesting in your world that you want to mention or brag about? No, oh, I've been all over the place. I think I've been traveling five out of the last six weeks or something like that. I did I notice of, this morning in the New York Times or on NPR that uh, it's a good thing that you're not in Hawaii this week like you were a few weeks ago because the beach in Waikiki is closed down due to a spill. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that would have made it <laughs> a little difficult to enjoy that paddleboard. So, uh, although we did get to experience at least the very front end of one of the hurricanes that was pushed down to a tropical storm, but it managed to screw up all of our flights. So I, I got to experience that at least. But oh um, well, such is life. I don't want to complain. Poor me. I go to <laughs> Hawaii. Yeah, I know. I can, just, I, I, can, I can just hear the chat room going nuts right now. So um, speaking of which, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get rolling. Um, just as a, a means of housekeeping for those of you that are joining us live, maybe for the first time, um, we do record all free webinar Wednesdays, and they are made available at freewebinarwednesdays.com. You can see I've got the site pulled up here, and when our presentation with Mr. Gillen is available, we'll push it out there, and you will have the ability to watch it again, share it with friends and colleagues and coworkers. Um, certainly, I'm, uh, I know today's session is going to be a great one. And as you watch today's session, if you have comments or questions or you'd like to interject some thoughts, please feel free to do so. We like to keep Free Webinar Wednesdays somewhat conversational and love hearing from our audience. So use the chat feature. Jeff and I will keep an eye on that during today's conversation. And uh, we've already given Paul a heads up. We might be interrupting him, but we get some good questions from the audience. So, uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. But we'd love to hear from you. So with those two housekeeping items out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and work the magic of go to webinar and send the presentation controls over to our guest today, Mr. Paul Gillen. And just a, a little bit of background about Paul, who mentioned a little bit more um, about some of his books and speaking and professional background. But Paul and I actually were at the same conference, the Michigan Bankers Association. I don't know if I even shared this with you, Paul, uh, a couple of years ago up in Traverse City. And one of the tools that I ran for the MBA when the conference was over was a tool called TweetReach, and it measures the impact and magnitude of social voice primarily through Twitter and hashtag. And it was at that point in time I realized that Paul was a social media rock star because as many tweets as I had done um, I paled in comparison. I think you had like 130,000 impressions uh, when you were tweeting up there compared to my, you know, maybe a few thousand. So uh, Paul is definitely somebody that's been around the web a while and has got some good social influence. And uh, um, we're going to talk today about attack of the customers. And I know that's a big concern with a lot of folks, particularly that Jeff and I talk to in the banking space, worried about what people are going to say and should we not be on social media to keep it from happening. And I think we'll find out that that pretty much is, is not an option. So with that somewhat long-winded introduction, Mr. Paul Gillen, a.k.a. Social Rockstar, welcome to Free Webinar <laughs> Wednesdays. Well, thank you, Eric. And uh, can you see my screen, first of all? Can you see the presentation? 
Uh, I do see attack of the customers. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, regarding the Twitter following, uh, I, I get a lot of comments on that. I have about 13,400 followers, I guess, but not like anybody's counting. And a lot of the secret of that was really just being there early. You know, I'm, I'm a joiner, so uh, I was at South by Southwest when Twitter was introduced in March of 2007. I didn't know what it was for. I didn't really get it. But I joined anyway because I just do that kind of thing. I was also one of the first 0.5% uh, of, of people on LinkedIn. And uh, in the early days, it was very easy to, to gain followers. So I think I had 10,000 followers within the first four years. And then it's taken me about four more to get to 13,000. So it's, it's <laughs> much more difficult now to, to add followers, I think, for everyone because people are more, are more uh, careful about who they follow. Um, this topic, I uh, appreciate the, the chance to present this to you today. This topic is something that has always fascinated me about social media. In fact, when I first became kind of enchanted with social media back in 2006, it was an incident uh, that happened or, uh, that year uh, involving a young man in uh, New York who recorded a very frustrating phone call with an AOL sales rep. He was trying to cancel his account and the rep would not let him cancel his account. And the phone call became a theater of the, the absurd after a, a few minutes and that um, wound up being posted. He, he posted the recording on his blog. It went viral and he wound up on the Today Show uh, six days later telling his story and just embarrassing AOL in front of a um, in front of a national audience. And that was back in the days before Facebook was a factor before Twitter was around. It was just bloggers, and I was fascinated by the idea that one person's actions, uh, one person's experience, could become a story that would resonate with so many people and would would achieve such uh, uh, broad uh, awareness and exposure so quickly. So this is really something that's fascinated me for a long time. So in my this is my my fifth book. Uh, about online communities and, and social media, and the one where I really indulged uh, this this longtime interest in understanding attack better, why they happen, and certainly they're more of a factor today than I think they have been uh, ever before. Uh, we've seen recent examples, certainly, that uh, have dramatized how uh, frequent and how uh, damaging these contacts, these attacks, can be. Uh, back in the spring, lumber liquidators, uh, they're uh, stock value, the uh, value of the company fell by uh, over one-third. Uh, in fact, it fell by half over the period of about a month uh, thanks to a report on 60 Minutes that alleged that the company was distributing flooring that had dangerous amounts of, um, of uh, formaldehyde, or at least it had amounts that exceeded the standards in California. Uh, so the 60 Minutes report is what did much of the damage, and Lumber Liquidators has never recovered. Its stock price has never recovered from this uh, this story. In fact, uh, Home Depot was later implicated in possibly selling the same uh, product, which came from a Chinese company. So a very damaging media report uh, for this company. And uh, but what kicked it off really was a post on a an investment site called Seeking Alpha by a young man who is a a day trader. Uh, he's from China. Apparently, he knew something about the company that was supplying lumber liquidators, and he posted back in June of 2013 that uh, the use of these products could be a problem for li lumber liquidators. Well, that was a year and a half before 60 Minutes picked up the story, uh, and it became a huge problem. But 60 Minutes and uh, and many other uh, all media outlets really are monitoring social media now to get leads on stories that they then develop. So the words of one young blogger working from information that he had uh, turned into a crisis that uh, took took out half of the market value of a, a name brand company. 25 year old guy, one person. And this kind of stuff happens all the time. And we see with the amplification power of social media that these events can uh, can quickly uh, erupt and become uh, become big problems for the companies that are attacked. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is why this happens, how it happens, the different kinds of attacks that occur, and how you can prevent them and insulate yourself uh, against them. More recently, of course, we've seen this uh, tragic case of the, uh, uh, the dentist, he, uh, who uh, Minneapolis dentist, I believe he's in Minneapolis, who uh, uh, killed this lion. He was led astray, apparently, by his guide, and uh, he went on a lion hunt, uh, wound up uh, killing a lion who was... Uh, uh, dearly loved by visitors to that uh, animal park, and uh, this guy had to go into hiding. Uh, he was uh, under federal protection for uh, for a few weeks. 
I believe he has just now begun to emerge again and start his practice over, but this was a, a case where social media essentially acted as uh, as judge, jury, and executioner for this person's action, which, by the way, was not illegal. Uh, it, whatever you may think morally of it, it was not illegal. Uh, so this is just another recent example of where social media amplifies outrage and can do a great deal of damage to, uh, to one person or one institution. So how does this happen, and uh, what what does it what what causes these uh, some issues to take on a life of their own and quickly spiral out of control? Well, let's look at an example that I used in my latest book, Attack of the Customers, uh, and it's something that I gained from uh, I was on the digital advisory board at uh, Procter and Gamble for several years and was uh, able to get some inside uh, information on an issue that they dealt with there back in uh, in 2010 and it concerned a new product called Pampers Drymax which was the result of 25 years of uh, research and was uh, considered to be their biggest innovation for the Pampers brand in 25 years when it was introduced in February 2010. Drymax was a new kind of diaper that was much thinner than earlier diapers. It was much more absorbent and it used a completely different type of material than had been used previously. Now to some people this meant that the diaper looked actually cheaper and in fact on the on the face of it you would think that it was a cheaper diaper uh, because the material was uh, almost like a almost felt like newspaper in, in some ways but that was the nature of the absorbent uh, gel that they were using to replace what had been essentially a cotton lining for many years and some people thought that this was uh, a case of Procter and Gamble trying to cheap out trying to substitute cheaper diapers for the pampers that they had loved for many years and uh, they began to uh, to attribute negative uh, impacts to the changes that Procter and Gamble had made now, one of these people is Rosanna Shaw, who lives in uh, in uh, Louisiana, and uh, she had noticed that her daughter's skin was red and hot to the touch. The daughter had diaper rash. Uh, she blamed this on the diaper. Uh, Rosanna Shaw, now diaper rash happens all the time. It, it afflicts uh, almost every child gets diaper rash at some point in his or her life. But Rosanna Shaw put two and two together and concluded that the diapers were the cause of the diaper rash. Now, it's important to understand a, a basic fact of biology. Diapers don't cause diaper rash. Diaper rash is caused by, uh, by a liquid being held too closely to the, uh, to the skin. And uh, the diaper may create that situation. It may create, if, if the diaper is really tight fitting, it may create a situation that would cause diaper rash. But diapers themselves have no ingredients that could cause diaper rash. But Rosanna didn't believe that. So she took to Facebook and she started a uh, Facebook page called Pampers Bring Back the Old Cruisers and Swaddlers. And uh, this quickly gained a, uh, a head of steam as other mothers who were wrestling with diaper rash understanding that diaper rash is scary to first-time moms in particular. They don't know what to do about it. Their child is in pain and there's really no uh, no cure for it other than trying to keep the child comfortable until it passes. Uh, so they were looking for someone to blame and they found this Facebook page and word began to spread. And within a couple of months this Facebook page was getting literally hundreds of new posts every day with moms whose babies had diaper rash who were attributing the problem to Pampers and Pampers was being uh, crucified up and down. Uh, they quickly spread into mainstream media and what you find by the way in these attack of the customers stories is that the inflection point is when the story spreads into mainstream media. It's rare that companies uh, endure lasting damage if a story simply stays in social channels. It's when it makes that jump to mainstream media that things really get out of hand. But understand that mainstream media is now watching social media very closely for clues of what it should report. The mainstream media has been brutalized by budget cuts, and so more and more of their stories are being uh, originating in social channels. So what happened is that the, the mainstream media began watching what was going on on Facebook, began reporting on that, and, and quickly you had every major news uh, outlet in, in the U.S. And, and even uh, abroad was covering this story. It led to a, uh, to uh, eventually to a federal investigation. Um, Procter & Gamble agreed to submit Pampers 
to uh, to um, uh, inquiry by the Consumer Product Safety Commission for uh, for investigation for analysis because this thing was completely out of control. Hundreds of posts a day accumulating on this Facebook page, and the media was all over Procter and Gamble. What had, they had hoped would be a really landmark new product rollout had turned into a nightmare. Now, to their relief, in September of 2010, the Consumer Product Safety Commission came back with their analysis. There was no link between new Pampers and rashers. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the sales of Pampers actually recovered and were even stronger after the, uh, after the crisis. And this is one of the sort of silver linings of social media attacks. When the, when the attack turns out to be uh, groundless, uh, companies can often recover very quickly and even benefit from the word of mouth that they get uh, as people become aware of a brand that perhaps they never heard of before. So AdAge reported uh, a year later that uh, the, the campaign that the negative buzz over Pampers had actually worked to its benefit and the company was selling more, uh, more diapers than ever. Uh, but as Paul Fox, the director of corporate communications at P&G, said, you can't join a community at a time of crisis. You have already invested in the community. This is what P&G learned the hard way. They were not aware of what was going on on Facebook until the situation had gotten out of hand. At that time, they tried belatedly to get involved in uh, the Facebook discussion and to, uh, to present their point of view. They were shot down. They were not members of the group. They were not respected. They were not really wanted. And so they had no chance to air their point of view. Uh, had uh, what, uh, had, what did work for Procter and Gamble was to actually fly in some prominent uh, mom bloggers to their headquarters in Cincinnati and spend a day with them talking about diaper rash and how diapers are made and the biology of diaper rash. And they got quite a bit of positive coverage from that. Uh, that, in addition to a media campaign, helped to turn the, this situation around, eventually capped by the favorable government finding. But they, they learned the hard way that when they created the media plan for Pampers, all they saw was good things. And uh, uh, my friend Shell Holtz, who has the wonderful podcast for immediate release, uh, ha always uh, cautions that when you campaign, when you develop a campaign for a new product, a new initiative, uh, really any new announcement you want to make, you should always think of what can go wrong. And you should be prepared for that. P&G learned that the hard way, but it's a lesson that I think any company should be aware of when they get excited about a new initiative and they want to roll it out to the public. Let's stop here for a second and see if there are any comments, uh, questions that have come across. Uh, we don't have any questions in the queue, but I just jotted down, and I think that quote really nailed me right between the eyes, and I like the fact that it reminds you, you, you know, you can't join a crisis after it's already happened because then you see like you're reacting to it. And all too often that is, I think, so much the case, particularly maybe in the financial services industry, but, um, you know, being part of the conversation, not because you're doing it particularly because of damage control, but you are aware of it. And then you're not seen as, oh, the only reason you're here now is because you want to save your butt as opposed to, You've been part of the dialogue all along. Now it's nice that you're chiming in because you've chimed in in the past and it doesn't look out of character. Absolutely. Um, it gives you street that's, cred. It's really powerful. It gives you street cred. And when uh, and people will give you the benefit of the doubt, if they feel that they know you, that you have been in the community when there was nothing for you to gain or, or no buts to save, uh, they're more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt when a crisis strikes. Yeah. So. As David uh, Michelle Davies of the Webby Award says, there's never been a better time to be a critic. Crises emerge from all kinds of different places. As the chart in the lower left shows, there are many different channels that spark crises, and they reach mainstream media at a higher speed than they, than they have in the past. So uh, as the Altimeter Group said in a report, companies are quick to deploy the latest social media technology, yet most are not prepared for the threat of social media crisis. We found that more than three-fourths could have been diminished or averted by simply, being, by simply considering the possibility of the downside. So when you get your executives all excited about, about jumping on board with this great new social networking thing, be aware that, that it's a little bit of a Faustian bargain. Because once you get into those social channels, you are responsible for responding to the people who speak to you, uh, whether they, uh, uh, whether those responses be good, uh, those comments be good or bad. You have to be responsive. You can't just be a one-way uh, conduit. 
Uh, let's look at another example of a, a, a an entire industry that was caught flat-footed and unable to uh, to respond to uh, or responded uh, late late and poorly to a crisis that came out of nowhere. Um, I'm sure that many of you remember the pink slime crisis of uh, of three years ago. The uh, all of a sudden a uh, ground beef became evil. Uh, it turned out that ground beef contained uh, say a product called lean finely textured beef or uh, LFTB which is essentially made from the uh, the scraps that are scraped off of bones in the um, uh, uh, in the abattoir um, that those scraps can't be used for anything else so they are cleansed with an ammonium solution and then they are mixed in with ground beef uh, the the uh, there's nothing uh, nothing unsafe about this. Uh, this practice has been going on since the uh, mid 80s and the USDA has several times reviewed uh, pink slime or lean finely textured beef and judged it to be safe. Uh, however, there was a prominent uh, host of a cooking show who uh, didn't agree. He thought that because the product was treated with ammonia that it should not be consumed and he took his case to his uh, to his cooking show and there uh, this was not by the way a, a you know a major market cooking show it was on a, a cable channel uh, but there it took on a life of its own and uh, this became the pink slime crisis and this is an example I use this as an example because it shows how quickly these uh, these crises can unravel so in March of 2012 ABC World News featured a segment on pink slime there's a jump to mainstream media again in a week later, Congress, Congresswoman Chelly Pingree and 41 Congress members asked U.S. Agriculture Secretary, uh, Secretary to stop using lean, finely textured beef in the school lunch program. Uh, a week after that, several of the nation's largest grocery chains said that they would drop lean, finely textured beef products from their shelves. Four days later, Beef Products Inc., the uh, largest maker of lean, finely textured beef, suspended its operations in three states, laid off 650 employees. And a week after that, the uh, second largest maker of lean, finely textured beef, AFA Foods, filed for bankruptcy. So we see in a space of less than four weeks here, uh, an issue becomes uh, that had n never been a crisis, uh, a product that had been on the market, in fact, for over 20 years without any problem whatsoever, uh, suddenly brought down uh, or nearly brought down the two largest companies in an entire industry. And the beef industry was completely unprepared for this. They had uh, no social media presence other than a Facebook page promoting their uh, It's What's for Dinner campaign. There was no uh, social dimension to its uh, website. And there was no one who was deputized to go out into social channels and to deal with this. And one of the reasons that I use this example is because it shows how the media world has changed. Now, the responsibility of media has historically been to tell the truth. Uh, media were the organizations that went in and calmed people down by telling, by, by getting at the facts. In this case, and if you remember back to this uh, story, what the media mainly focused on was the hysteria. Uh, there was, in fact, no major media outlet that did a, uh, that did a serious investigation into the facts surrounding pink slime or lean finely textured beef. Had they done that, they would have discovered that this product has been certified safe by the USDA uh, on several occasions. Uh, but the media instead was just fascinated by the social media uh, um, conflagration that grew up around it and really dropped the ball on this. I think it shows how the media is it's harder and harder for us now to trust the media to do that due diligence to, uh, to get at the truth they are increasingly reactive to what they see uh, happening uh, on Facebook and, and Twitter. So let's look at some of the weapons of choice. And uh, certainly the uh, Facebook has become a primary, uh, primary way that um, uh, customers, consumers in particular, take their case to, uh, to the public. So uh, in uh, 2011, a, uh, the Bank of America began imposing fees on customers uh, who use ATM cards, uh, charging them $2 a month to, uh, to use their cards. Uh, one young woman in California, Kristen Christian, uh, was upset about this, and she took, it, took her cause to Facebook, where she found a, um, 
a willing audience of other Bank of America cardholders who were uh, similarly outraged. And uh, this exploded into something called Bank Transfer Day, in which people were encouraged to close their Bank of America accounts and move to credit unions, which about 75,000 people did. Um, in fact, the uh, chief executive of the Credit Union National Association said, I think we may look back in a few years and say this was the spark that caused a lot of people to say, yes, credit unions are a better deal. Well, I don't know if that's the case or not, but uh, that's a matter of opinion. But the fact is the Bank of America, uh, over a $2 charge, uh, it faced a, a large migration of customers uh, away to other banks. And uh, this was all essentially coordinated by one young woman uh, in Los Angeles. She also, there was actually another young lady on the East Coast who had a similar campaign that, uh, that helped to stoke the fires. But this was another case of where two people uh, starting a cause and bringing their passion to the case uh, were able to, to bring a, a very large uh, company to its knees. And in fact, Bank of America rescinded that policy quickly. So consumers now are in control. I don't think there's any question about that with all the channels that we now have to share our, uh, our good experiences as well as our bad. Uh, the site like The Consumerist, which is a, a primary amplifier of, uh, of people's experiences, will take um, uh, stories that are submitted to it by its readers, uh, will investigate them, and will uh, will amplify them. And very often, these crises are the result of a single interaction. Uh, someone's interaction with a customer service representative uh, will become a uh, essentially a story that triggers a, a larger reaction. And this is because of the power of storytelling. You know, if any. Uh, Anyone was around when Reagan was president, you know that Ronald Reagan was a master of storytelling. He would uh, come back against uh, mounds of, uh, of data with a simple story that would uh, essentially uh, contradict his critics, and, and he would win because he would tell a story that would resonate better with the audience than the mountains of data that his, uh, his opponents had collected. So stories are very powerful, and individual stories that we have, encounters that we have with people, that may, uh, may irritate us can trigger uh, large reactions by others who perhaps have had similar, uh, similar um, encounters. We also have the, uh, the multiplicative value of sites like Yelp and TripAdvisor, which, can, uh, which have essentially become the, the brokers in some cases of, uh, of excellence, of good and bad, or of success and failure in the markets that they serve. I love the example of uh, if you're going to, going to stay in Denver, uh, you, can go, you can go to TripAdvisor and see that the Brown Palace Hotel and Spa, uh, with 1,182 reviews, is the number one rated hotel in Denver. Uh, at the other end is the Star Motel, which is the lowest rated of all the hotels that are rated in Denver, with comments like, why isn't this place shut down or do not stay here? Now, if you're the Star Motel, what do you do about this? Uh, you can't market your way out of this problem. You can't buy advertising to, to solve this problem. You've got to fix the problem. And that's why the customers in control has changed the dynamics of business, where now the, um, the uh, customers are, uh, the responsibility of the business is to deliver a superior experience. We can't get away with delivering poor products or poor experiences anymore because people will tell each other about them and, uh, and we'll lose business as a result. So. What TripAdvisor and Yelp and other sites like it have done is become equalizers in their market where they force companies to compete on the quality of the products they offer. And when you come down to it, that's what they should be doing anyway. The size of your advertising budget should not be determining your success in the market. It should be the quality of the experience you deliver. Let's look at the what I call the four types of aggressors. And in the book, we outline uh, four types of, of customer critics. And, uh, and how you can categorize them and strategies for responding to them. The first type, and uh, really the most benign type, are the casual complainers. And uh, we're all casual complainers at some level. We like to gripe about bad experiences. Certainly, certain uh, uh, industries suffer more than others. Airlines, um, uh, package delivery companies, uh, banks, in fact, are, are uh, uh, frequent targets. Are uh, people just have bad experiences with them because it's it's part of doing business. I, in particular, you look at, at uh, I like to look at the example of package delivery companies, uh, which I say uh, perform miracles every day. They manage to take 
packages and move them thousands of miles overnight, which I still think is a miracle. And in the process of doing that, um, stuff goes wrong. It's not always going to work out. And when the stuff goes wrong, people go to the Facebook pages and they gripe. So go to the DHL Facebook page, the FedEx Facebook page, the U.S. Post Office, the UPS Facebook page. And what you find there is lots and lots of people complaining. In fact, almost everything people post on those pages is, is complaints. And these companies have become very good at managing these complaints. They're calm, they're rational, they move the discussions offline, and they resolve the problem because they know that when you resolve the problem, when you listen to the complainer, the vast majority of people will be satisfied. So casual complainers are the background noise of customer relations. The risk is low because they usually are not that upset. They're not going to start a campaign. They're just griping. Their activity is high because uh, people, some people gripe a lot, and some uh, industries in particular will see a lot of gripes. Their aggravation level is moderate because they're really not going to bring your company down, but they will. Uh, they do create a setup of a background noise that becomes a, a source of frustration. The strategy for dealing with these people is customer-focused policies, which means that your policy should be focused around the needs of the customer rather than your own needs. I love the example of what Land's End and L.L. Bean do. They say that when you buy a product from them, you can return that product at any time, for any reason, for a full run, refund, no questions asked. You buy a pair of jeans, you keep them for 10 years, you send them back to L.L. Bean, they send you a full refund, no questions asked. That is what I call a customer-focused policy. Now, why does this work for L.L. Bean? It works because nobody ever takes advantage of that policy. Sure, some people do return goods after what we would consider a normal warranty period, but people don't abuse policies like this. And that's why when you offer what, uh, what may seem to be extremely generous customer service policies, you're really not taking a big risk because people don't take advantage of you. And when people do return a product five years later, there often is a good, re good reason for them to do that. And when you, when you give them a full re refund, you are going to delight them so much that they will tell their friends about you, and you will get bonus business from the goodwill that you generate. That's why those extremely customer service uh, friendly policies work. So for, look at your customer service policies. When a customer complains and you have to and you're citing policy as a response, is the policy something that will feel good to the customer or is it something that feels good to your legal counsel? If it's the latter, then change it. The extortionists are the most dangerous and the most annoying. These are the people who are motivated by personal gain. They're out to get something for nothing. And the good news is that only about, depending on the source, le certainly less than 5% of, of all complaints um, in social media are, are driven by this kind of motivation. Most people complain, in fact, because they want the problem fixed, not because they want to get a freebie. That's why giving people freebies, or uh, at least generous freebies, is usually not a good idea. It's usually not necessary. This small group is out to get you because they want something for nothing. So the risk is moderate because they can uh, potentially, they're often very angry, and they can touch off a firestorm. The uh, activity is low. You don't hear very often from an extortionist. The aggravation is very high because they will keep coming back and back and back until you satisfy them. The strategy I recommend is to fight fire with fire, which is don't give them anything that you wouldn't give anybody else. Once you give in to an extortionist, once you make an exception, give them an, ex an excessively generous form of compensation, they will tell others about their experience, and then you're going to have to do that for others in the future. They raise the bar in effect. These people usually are extremists. They don't have that much of a case, but they will press their case very hard. If necessary, and if, if someone is, uh, is refusing to listen to your uh, to consider your offer, if you make reasonable offers to satisfy them, they refuse to consider them, you may have to actually go back in the same social channels they use and tell what you did, what you offered. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly, a perfectly reasonable response if you are at your wit's end and you can't, if, if you've made two offers and they've both been, uh, been denied and the person is continuing to trash you, it's okay to, well, I'll never, I would never say trash them back, it's okay to tell the audience what offer you made, so the audience can evaluate it on its own merits. Very small group of people, but very aggravating. The most troublesome types of people are the committed crusaders, and uh, such as Kristen Christian uh, in the Bank of America case. 
Now I mentioned a young woman on the uh, on the East Coast, Molly Catchpole. At the same time, Kristen was uh, was conducting her uh, her Facebook campaign against Bank of America. Molly was doing the same thing on the East Coast. 21 years old, recent college graduate. She closed her account and she cut up her debit card, and she was filmed cutting cutting up her debit card by media organizations from all over the world. If you search on Molly Catchpole uh, on Google, you'll see what I'm talking about. This young woman created a, a huge media circus around the Bank of America fees and she's now a social media consultant by the way which it seems is what everybody does when they uh, when they become successful at something like this uh, committed crusaders have a higher calling often they usually are not looking for compensation they're not looking for you to give them anything they are looking to do the right thing and so you think of uh, committed cru prominent committed crusaders might be a uh, Greenpeace or PETA for example Big organizations, smart people, well-resourced in many cases, very committed to their cause, and they are um, uh, they are persistent. They will go at you for years if necessary. So, uh, you know, if you're cutting down forests in the Amazon, um, committed crusaders are going to target you, and they're going to latch onto you, and they're not going to let go. The risk is very high because they are so because they're smart. They're resourceful, they know how to use the tools, they have media contacts, they're media savvy, and they can hurt you. Uh, the activity level is low because they generally only target industries where there really is a significant problem to be addressed. Uh, the aggravation level is high because they are so persistent and so smart. The strategy to uh, combat them, facts and education, which is if you have a reasonable story to tell, then you need to use your own channels to tell that story. You don't want really to get into shouting matches with these people. You never want to get into shouting matches, for that matter. But if you have a story to tell, be ready to to launch a website uh, or to take your campaign through your PR channels to tell your side of the story. Um, it's a good idea, and, and many smart companies have done this. Have registered their brands, uh, the domains of their brands, with the extensions uh, like Sucks, uh, because they can, uh, you know, Bank of America sucks because they know that that's the first thing. Uh, the community crusaders do uh, will do will be to to try to um, co-opt those kinds of domains. Um, so be ready. N have a strategy plan in place. Know your vulnerabilities. If you have labor practices that may be questionable, for example, you need to have a strategy that if this blows up, you can launch a counter uh, a counter offensive to uh, uh, to combat it. Also, consider listening to them because sometimes they really have a point and sometimes maybe you should listen to them and do what they want you to do. Uh, you'll get brownie points if you do the right thing, um, even though you may feel like you're capitulating to a committed crusader, uh, sometimes doing what's right is, is the best thing to do. So listen to them, be prepared with a good story, with a believable story of your own, have your social channel, uh, social media and, and web channels locked and loaded. Uh, the final category of attackers are the, uh, the irritable influencers. And these are the people who have big followings and uh, have, have irritating experiences. And by virtue of simply their throw weight, the volume of people who listen to them, they can be a problem uh, by uh, their individual experience can become a problem for you simply because they can, uh, they can shout about it. They can achieve such volume of, um, of audience. Uh, very quickly. Uh, as Kevin Smith found when he was denied a seating on a uh, Southwest Airlines flight, he's a big guy. He wanted to sit across two seats. It was a full flight. Southwest said no. Kevin took his case to Twitter. He took it to his podcast, and it created a minor um, public relations uh, problem for uh, Southwest. Now, to his credits, Southwest stuck to its guns. And this is what goes back to something I said earlier. Have customer focused, have understandable and customer focused policies. Southwest policy was if we have the space and we have customers who don't fit in one seat, we will do our best to accommodate them. If we don't have the space, we are entitled to deny boarding if they can't fit in the seat. That was their policy. It's a reasonable policy. They fell back to that. People understood it. This problem went away very quickly. So when irritable influencers uh, hit you, the risk is high because they can cause a flash mob to form very quickly just because they have so many followers. The activity level is fairly low because these are mostly busy people who don't have time to get involved in causes like this. Their aggravation is high because they do have so many followers. 
remember to remain calm, prepare to fall on your sword, be, be able to, to cite customer focused policies. If you can't do that, be ready to say, we were wrong. The fastest way to get a, uh, to, to quell a firestorm is to say, we're sorry, we did the wrong thing, it won't happen again. By, and by the way, I want to talk here just to, uh, for a moment. Uh, there's a, a wonderful book that I read in, in preparing this book um, called A Complaint is a Gift. And uh, if you're in customer service, I highly recommend this book. It looks at the, so, the psychology and the sociology of complaints and what are psychologically the most effective response mechanisms. It turns out that uh, apologizing is not the first thing you should do when someone complains. The authors make the case that the first thing you should do is thank them. That what the reason people complain is not because they want something, they want you to give them something, it's because they want you to fix the problem. They want to be sure others don't encounter the same situation. So when you thank them and you tell them that you're uh, that you find their advice valuable and you will uh, you will uh, route it to the proper authorities, and when you promise to follow up and give them a resolution of the case. Most people will be happy with that. That's all they want. Also, research done by Dell, which looked at, at hundreds of thousands of social media interactions they've conducted over the years, uh, they, re they released about a year ago uh, the results of analysis of their response uh, mechanisms and, and what, the, what the outcomes were. Now, Dell has a policy of responding to every single negative comment posted in every major social media channel. And the idea is that even if they can't fix your problem, they at least want to acknowledge that you have a problem. And Dell's research, uh, they concluded that uh, over 90% of people who complain in social channels can be satisfied, can walk away satisfied uh, by simply having their comments acknowledged and someone listening to them. Uh, in fact, it was north of 95%. Even more remarkable was that almost 45% of those people actually turn into raving fans. They actually go from being demoters to being promoters. Why is that? Well, because people don't expect companies to take them seriously. So when you really listen to them, when you really care, when you show that you care about what they have to say, it, it completely turns them around. They're surprised, they're delighted, and suddenly they become your biggest fan. So all it takes really is listening, acknowledging, and showing openness to what they have to tell you. So let's uh, going into sort of our, our, our bullet points about what you do. I'm first going to uh, stop here and say if there are any um, uh, questions that have come in or any comments you guys want to make, now it's time to do it. Good stuff. Um, we do have uh, a couple of comments. Um, one uh, listener slash attendee. Uh, makes a comment, uh, with all these good and bad examples, why is this not a no-brainer for companies? <laughs> why, why is it taking so long for people to wake up and smell the coffee? So what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think uh, it, it often isn't. In, it, it's like insurance. You know, people don't buy insurance until they need it. Uh, the, the, uh, it's often a crisis that compels companies to uh, to take action. A crisis that hits them or hits another company in their business. Um, you know, it's hard to get people to prepare for something that may never happen. Uh, that's why a lot of companies don't have good disaster recovery policies. Uh, they're not compelled to do so, so they don't want to spend the money. They don't want to take the time. Uh, so I think it's yeah. just human nature. This is the they they hope for the best, uh, and uh, and you know sometimes that's a good strategy, but it's usually not a smart strategy. Yeah, and then there was one other question that came in just after the last round of questions. There was a pie chart on that slide that referred to community as a slice, and so I don't know if you can just quickly pop back to that real quick. Yeah, uh, and yep. the right, uh, and what you see. This is a bad slide because this slice down here at the uh, uh, at the lower right is um, Facebook. But yeah, community yep. is a slice. So, so what do you mean by community? Is that in an offline, non-social media arena? Because all of those Twitter, blog, YouTube, those all relate to social media. Is that something that happens offline, or yeah, the, is it a different? Yeah, I think that's, that, a, that's, that's a good point. There. That's a good point. Uh, some of the, the the less prominent, many of the less prominent problems occur in communities where people of uh, uh, often people have uh, 
a lot of expertise in an area or they're passionate fans gather and because of their passion and their expertise they are deeply invested in uh, in what each other has to say so uh, I'll give you an example of this I worked with a company uh, a couple of years ago that was um, was having trouble selling into small businesses. They had a software product that they sold to small businesses. Very brand name company. You, every, everybody would would know them. Uh, and so we went to a, a website called SpiceWorks, which has a membership of about three million small business IT professionals. And we looked at the the ratings uh, that were happening there, and and they were d deplorable. The ratings were you know one star, one star out of five. And uh, it turned out that the, the reason people were rating them so badly was because they really didn't understand the product. And so there was an education campaign that needed to be done to reach out to these people who rated them poorly and to, to tell them you know, what they needed to understand. That they weren't using the product in the right way. Now, this kind of activity would have been completely, the, the company was completely unaware that this negative activity was going on because they weren't monitoring this community. There are many communities out there of enthusiasts where uh, where very deep conversations are going on. Ford, Ford endured a, a crisis uh, several years ago through a, uh, a community of, of online truck enthusiasts when it tried to to shut down some uh, brand of merchandise the, uh, the site was selling. Um, its lawyers were too heavy-handed. The community reacted uh, negatively and, uh, and began a, uh, a media campaign. It spread into the media <clears throat> of uh, Ford trying to crush some little website owner. Well, it turned out that this community was very passionate. They spent a lot of money on trucks, and they were able to actually materially material influence Ford's bottom line. Now, that never hit mainstream media. It never hit the Twitter sphere, but it did cause a, a, a big headache for, for Ford trucks uh, in this uh, small community. So the point there is that professional communities, enthusiast communities, can often be, um, they're great sources of feedback, by the way, but they can also be uh, sources where, where rebellion is fomented by people who really care. So I hope that helps. Cool. Yeah, that does. Let me uh, see if we've got any other questions that have come in. Um, okay. Yep, we've got one more. Uh, how often does ego get in the way of people responding timely and correctly in the time of crisis? How often does ego get in the way? Um, it, it, it happens all the time, uh, and it's really when you see companies go silent at a time of of crisis, it is often because uh, the executives don't want to admit they're wrong. Um, so yeah, it, it's because it, CEOs, generally speaking, don't like bad news, and so when you've got a crisis uh, erupting, the CEO is the one who has to essentially say uh, uh, they are are. Um, uh, you know, we did the wrong thing here, or, or they'll deed that to to an underling, uh, and the delay is because they aren't ready to admit that they were wrong. We saw this happen uh, about a year ago. Um, J.P. Morgan inexplicably decided that they would do a Twitter chat with their top uh, executive uh, called Ask J.P.M., uh, believing that uh, customers desperately wanted to know what J.P. Morgan uh, cared about, what J.P. Morgan had to say. And mindless of the fact that J.P. Moore, that for many people who had lost homes or who who had been bankrupted during the uh, uh, the financial downturn, J.P. Morgan was seen as the devil. And of course, uh, those people quickly co-opted the Ask J.P.M. hashtag uh, to use it to just slam this company. Now it was the company uh, endured this for about three days before they finally canceled the Twitter chat and called off the whole thing. Um, during which time I think ego was a big was a big part of the reason for for delaying the response so much. And by the way, to this day, the Ask JPM hashtag is being used to slam this company. So um, ego plays a big part. You need to have companies that respond most effectively are companies that listen closely to their customers and are really tuned in to to getting better and are willing to listen to that feedback and admit when they can do things better. Those companies catch a break. They have the fewest attacks. They have the most loyal customers, and I don't know why more companies don't operate that way. Yeah, good. Well, I, I've got a couple of other things, but I'm going to save those to the end because I don't want to take time away, and I know we want to get through this slide, and I think there may be a few more. So let's go ahead and push on. There are three, and, uh, slides, three slides left. Uh, three have slides a good, left. 
have a good monitoring strategy. Monitor Google Alerts, Twitter, uh, hashtags. Look for uh, hashtags like fail next to your name. Look for words like sucks, hate. If it's in uh, certain industries, you may want to look for things like blue screen crash, won't start, overheats. Uh, look for your name when associated with those keywords. Set a baseline of negativity. You know, even Apple, even Apple has about 20% negative social media uh, chatter. Uh, so even much loved companies have a few critics. Don't let it don't let it uh, get your goat when a few people complain. That's fine. It's when a lot of people are complaining. You want to look for the spikes in volume that indicate a problem. Uh, monitor the posts by others on Facebook pages you own. Remembering remember that Fauci bargain I talked about. You set up a Facebook page, you are creating a a deal with.